Good morning, everybody. I want to read just a little section from Isaiah 12, and then we're going to worship the Lord. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. Amen? Amen. For Yahweh God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to Yahweh. Call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to Yahweh, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. God, we love you, and Jesus, we invite you into this room. Lord, come, Holy Spirit. Just say that right now. Just say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this room with your presence, Lord. Jesus, you're the guest of honor. You're the lead pastor. You're the one we worship and adore. Come fill this room, and we pray that all the glory and honor would go to you and that this worship would rise to you like incense. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, church. We're so, so blessed to have you here this morning. Um, I just want to encourage you guys before we get into our time of worship to just be here, be present, be with the Lord. He's here and he loves you guys. (laughs) So let's sing this together. Stop the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of.
Morning Church, welcome. Oh 
Father in heaven, we thank you so much just for this day, Lord. We thank you for the gathering of your people, God. We thank you for the safety that you bring, God, the peace above all understanding. Thank you for bringing each individual here today, Lord. We are so thankful for you, God. We just want you to overwhelm us, Lord. We welcome you into this place. We want more and more of you, Lord. Give us more of you. We want more of you, Lord. We just want us to take this time just to focus. God of the universe is in this room. The beginning and the end. The Alpha, the Omega. We're so thankful for you, Lord. We're so thankful for you, Lord.
on my soul Oh, come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Let's sing that out, church So come on my soul don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those arms Get up and praise the Lord Come on, come on, come on my soul Yeah, come on church oh, Don't you get shy on me, lift yeah, come up on. your soul Come on Cause you've got a lion
Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah.
Jesus, we're not playing church. We're not going through the motions. Our confession is that we want you, Jesus. 
We confess there's nothing better than you. There's nothing more beautiful than you. There's nothing higher than you. There's nothing else in this world that we desire apart from you, Jesus. You're the only one who fills. You're the only one who satisfies. You're the only one who can heal us and fill all the empty places, Jesus. We confess this morning that you are the greatest thing in New York City, Jesus. Jesus, we want you. Come, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come into this room, God. We desperately need you, Lord Jesus. God, pour out your Holy Spirit. Bring revival. Awaken your people, God. Turn back the darkness. Stop the violence and the hate. Bring healing, God. Stop the forces of darkness. And Jesus Christ, conquer this city for your glory. Conquer this city for your glory, Lord Jesus. Move in New York City. We worship you, Jesus. Come on, one more time through. Sing to Yeshua with all that you have. above all of the names that no demon can stand within two feet of you Lord without your permission God you are sovereign over all Lord you're sovereign over the good you're sovereign over the bad Lord we trust you Lord we in this room right now Lord we trust you Lord we put our full lives into your hands God we surrender we surrender our lives to you, Lord. We trust you. We know who you are. We know who you are going to be. You are never changing, Lord. We thank you for just dwelling among us for a fraction of, of time for you, Lord. We pray a blessing over each individual in this room, Lord. You hear the prayers. You hear the praise, Lord. We lift it all to you, God. And Holy Spirit, fill this room even more. We just want more of you, Lord. Fill us till we overflow. Fill us till we overflow, Lord. Overflow our cup, Lord. We want to pour out ourselves, Lord, onto your feet. We want to bow down. We want to pour ourselves out. We live to honor you. We do this to honor you, Lord. We ask that you're glorified in this time today. I ask that you speak through our pastor, anoint him, anoint him with the Holy Spirit. Speak through Pastor Mike and to us, Lord. All the glory and all the honor and all the praise forevermore to Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's give the worship team a round of applause. Man, you don't even want moments like that to end, amen? All right, well, take a minute. I want you to take two minutes. I want you to hug, side hug two people, a nice, clean side hug, and say, Jesus loves you very much, okay? And then you can sit down. Take two minutes, meet a couple new people, give them a nice Christian side hug, and say, Jesus loves you very, very much.
All right, guys, let's go ahead and grab a seat. Go ahead and sit down. Let's hear from Miss Sydney doing announcements. Okay, so the last time I was up here, it was the first Sunday of Black History Month. So today is the last Sunday of Black History Month. And so when I came up here, I taught you something very special. I am putting you on the spot. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Oh, yes, you remember. That's amazing. Yeah. It's funny because if you enter into a room full of like majority black people, even if it's not particularly religious, if you say God is good, you can guarantee that like the room will respond all the time. But I <laughs> learned that it's actually a um, a tool for like spiritual unity in the room. So it is it's a practice of bringing everybody together under one sound and one truth, which is that God is good all the time and all the time He is good. So. I thought that was cool. But anyways, we have just a few announcements about some of the things that are going on here at Movement. Um, first up, house churches are relaunching this Tuesday. Um, and so we're revamping. It's a whole new style. So we're going to be meeting every Tuesday for the next six weeks. We'll be going through the book Forgotten God. I just got my copy. You can get your copy over at the table over by the refreshments. They're just about $22. Um, and so we're going to uh, read the first chapter by Tuesday. There are three locations. We have the Upper Manhattan location hosted by Sharon and Xavier. We have the Lower Manhattan location hosted by Solo, Izzy, Rachel, and Allison. And we have the Queens location. Yes, give it up for them. And uh, we have the Queens location hosted by Rath and Becky. Just make sure that you RSVP on the website because space is limited. Um, but we want to make sure that you guys come out and we read this uh, really great book. We're going deeper with the Lord this year. And so it's a really great opportunity to build community and also... Um, to drown a little bit in Jesus. So, uh, yeah, it'll be at 7 p.m. at those three different locations. You can find more um, information on the website at movementnyc.org. Um, next up, we have Seek Night, which is, yes, Seek Night is next Thursday. Um, child care will be provided for Seek Night, so we welcome everybody, uh, young and old. We'd love to have you out there. It'll be next Thursday at 7 p.m. at this location. Um, if you've never been, it's a great time. Oh. Sydney, it'll be Thursday, March 9th. Ooh, Thursday, March 9th? Excuse me. <laughs> Thursday, March 9th um, at uh, this location at 7 p.m. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I'm not sure if you've been like kind of watching the news or sort of paying attention, but I feel like there's this really kind of special thing that is happening with the Lord and his presence kind of across the country um, to the degree that it's making it even into like major news outlets, which I think is really cool. Um, obviously, Seek Night is always special, but I don't know. I just feel like this one is going to be like particularly unique. So I would encourage you to come out to that. Um, next up, we have volunteer needs. Just a, one volunteer need uh, this time, which means you guys have been signing up, which is special. Um, so we need help with lyrics, the lyrics that go up on uh, the screen behind us. Um, super special jobs. Becky uh, does a lot of the work with that so you could speak with her. Um, and you also have volunteer cards on your seats. You can fill out a form there, or you can um, fill out information, I believe, on... Can you fill out information on the website for volunteering? Yeah, you can fill out information on the website. Um, and if you fill, fill out a volunteer card, you're welcome to hand them to another leader in the room, or you can put them in the box over by the refreshments table. Um, next up, we have prayer. We're a community that believes in prayer. Um, if you're someone that needs prayer after church today, um, I am on the prayer team, so I'll be available. And also Nicole Lyons in the fabulous skirt will be available as well. Um, yes, we'd love to pray for you. And if for any reason you don't necessarily feel comfortable coming up to one of us, you're also welcome to fill out a prayer card also available on your seat. Um, and you can put that in the box also over by the refreshments table. Um, either way, your confidentiality will be honored. Um, but yeah, we'd love to pray for you. Uh, last but not least, we have giving. Now, I know between rent and Con Edison, it's really, it's, it's giving broke, but um, I, feel like <laughs> I feel like giving is uh, such an important tool, um, especially because we're really giving back to the Lord what already belongs to him. Um, obviously, we encourage you to pray about it, to find the word, talk to the Holy Spirit, and when you're ready, we have just a few ways to give. You can start with Venmo um, at Movement NYC. You can also give via check um, made out to Movement NYC. You can give via the debit or credit form on your seats. Um, you can also give online, either uh, one time or recurring, um, at movementnyc.org. And last but not least, um, you can also give cash, which is, uh, there's also a box, another box available over by the refreshment table. So we're going to pray. Um, 
Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence and uh, for the gift of your presence and this opportunity to be able to gather together as a community to learn more about you um, and how beautiful and interesting you are. I pray that you'll bless Pastor Mike as he comes up and shares whatever it is that you've placed on his heart and help us just to honor him, um, honor you by honoring him with our time and our attention. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give Sydney a round of applause for doing announcements. And look, I really encourage you guys to uh, go to one of the house churches Tuesday nights. We're doing them different this time because we want to go deeper. The topic in Forgotten God is the Holy Spirit. And I think that's one of the things that the Lord is really working in our community. It's just a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit, a deeper experience of the Holy Spirit. There'll be even space uh, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit within those house churches. So I really encourage you to join a house church. And then you absolutely do not want to miss Seek Night on Thursday, March 9th. Amen. Can any of my Seek Nighters give me a round of applause on how amazing Seek Nights are? And, and Sydney's exactly right. God is moving in the United States. Revival is coming. Revival's already here. I got to go to the Asbury Revival Thursday night in Kentucky in the middle of nowhere. Amen. And I had a, it was just awesome. And part of what was so magic about it was it was just all Gen Z. Gen Z kids leading the worship, Gen Z kids sharing testimonies. And I kept thinking what the enemy meant for evil, the Lord will use for good. Amen. And here's a generation that Satan thought he had, that Satan thought he had destroyed. And actually, I believe Gen Z is going to be a revival generation. That Satan always overplays his hand, he always goes too far, and that's what he did with Gen Z, and Gen Z are waking up to Jesus, and they're going to be one of the great Christian generations. And I just sat there over on the right-hand side, just literally just weeping as, as Gen Z kid after Gen Z kid after Gen Z kid talked about how Jesus had set them free from depression, how Jesus set them free from uh, addiction and suicidal thoughts, and it was just the most beautiful thing to see how God was moving on that campus. But we want to see that here in New York City, amen? We want to see revival in New York City, and that's what we're going after as a church, and I hope you'll come along and join us. Also, um, last Sunday we set it up, but over to my right we have a communion station, and we're going to work on having another communion station on the other side of the building. There's also two rugs over there. And what I would encourage you to do is during the first worship set or the second worship set, if you want to, get out of your seat, go take communion. There's old school communion, the way we used to do it, where you can take the bread and dip it in the juice, if you're really courageous, amen. And then there's COVID safe communion as well. And you can get on those rugs, you can get on your knees, you can reach out to a leader, we'll pray for you, but we really want to create an environment where we can encounter God and be transformed by that encounter. So take advantage of the communion area over there. Now on Sunday mornings, we're doing a series in the Gospel of Mark, and the title of today's message is Jesus First Religion. And our passage is Mark chapter two, verses 23 through 28. So on your seat, there's a note sheet. Pull that note sheet out, because you're gonna need it, because I have a bunch of quotes that I wanna share with you guys today. And let's read through our passage, and then I'm gonna take a few minutes and unpack it. And actually, even before I share this, there's one other thing I wanna share about is it's been shared with me that there's a number of people in our community that, that have been wrestling with suicidal thoughts. And there's a couple things I wanna say about that. First of all, if you're battling suicidal thoughts, please come talk to us, amen? That's not a burden that you need to carry alone. And if you reach out to us, you, there's no shame. All you're gonna find from us is empathy and understanding. We wanna pray for you, we wanna walk with you, we wanna help you. Do not feel like that's something you need to be ashamed of or that you need to hide or keep to yourself. Please come see one of us. And if you're too afraid to talk to me, I don't know why people are afraid to talk to me. <laughs> I can point you to somebody who can pray with you and talk with you and spend time with you. And there's two other things. Also, what I would encourage you to do, if it's a really persistent thing and you're really concerned about it, I would get counseling. Redeemer Presbyterian Church has an outstanding counseling program. It's called uh, Redeemer Counseling. Um, I've, I've gone through some of their training stuff when I was in a cohort with Tim Keller. It's absolutely excellent. It's biblical. Reach out. Get therapy. Get counseling. And then also last Sunday, Solomon, didn't Solomon do such an excellent job preaching last Sunday? It's Solomon and Sydney's world. I just live in it, amen? It's like, 
And Solomon had this one little great point that he made about suicidal thoughts, and that clip is on our Instagram, and I just kind of put some just little helpful tips on, on kind of managing your thought life. And so just go to our Instagram, read those little basic things, come see us, we would love to pray for you, there's no judgment, no shame, and if you really need to, please get professional counseling. And if you need, again, if you need help, come see us, and we can connect you with Redeemer Counseling, we're here to help you. And the church is to be a healing house, the church is to be a healing community, and we want to see Jesus heal all of us physically and mentally and spiritually in every possible way. Amen? Okay. Let's read our passage, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to take a few minutes and unpack this. Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, in the English Standard Version, it's on your note sheet, or you can pull it up you know, in your own Bible. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was not made for man, but man, no, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. And right now, Jesus, speak to us. You are the pastor of this church. You are our good shepherd. And we ask you would feed us and speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So one Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field of grain, and as they're walking through this field of grain, Jesus' disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And they actually were allowed to do this. The Old Testament law had a provision in it where if you were poor and you needed something to eat, you could take a handful of grain from somebody's field. You couldn't put a sickle in, but you could grab a handful of grain if you were hungry and you needed something to eat. It was a kind of like social security plan, amen, that was built in to the law and the life of Israel. It wasn't, nobody in Israel was gonna starve to death. Nobody in Israel was gonna go hungry. And so God had these kind of interesting little provisions within the law, and one of them was, you could do this. So they're not doing anything wrong. But when the Pharisees see this, they're scandalized. They clutch their pearls, and they're like, I can't believe they're doing that. And they're scandalized because in their minds, the disciples are working and you were forbidden to work on the Sabbath. So they turn to Jesus and they say, Jesus, look what your disciples are doing. Because in Jesus' day, a rabbi was responsible for the conduct of his disciples and so they're blaming Jesus. <laughs> they're like, your disciples are out of control and it's your fault, Jesus, amen? So, and Jesus responds to the Pharisees by reminding them of a, very of a very special story in 1 Samuel chapter 21 of David eating what was called the bread of the presence, which we're gonna talk about towards the end of the message. I think it's very fascinating. And the context of the story was King David was on the run, or the future King David, David was on the run from King Saul, and him and his men, they had run out of food, they didn't have anything to eat, and so David and his men went to the tabernacle, and they took the bread that was within the tabernacle, and they ate it, and, the, and Jesus gave it, and, and David gave it to some of his men. And David didn't get in trouble for it, amen? And so what Jesus is saying here is he, he's pointing out really two important truths. And the first important truth, Jesus says that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And what Jesus is saying is human need is more important than religious observance. Yes, the tabernacle was important, but it wasn't more important than David and his men starving to death. God didn't create people so that he would have somebody to observe the Sabbath. No, he created people first because he loves people. Why did God create you? God created you because he loves you. God created you because he wants to have a relationship with you. As you're sitting here today, you're thinking, what's the meaning of life? Why do I exist? Why am I here? God created you because he wants to know you, because he wants to be in a relationship with you. In a sense, it's like God made his own friends. <laughs> God wanted friends, so he created people so he could have a relationship with us. That's why we're here. And so God didn't create people to observe the Sabbath. He gave us the Sabbath as a gift. And what the Sabbath is, is the Sabbath is a day off. It's a day to rest and relax and be refreshed. 
And the tabernacle didn't exist for its own sake, but it existed as a way to bless and help mankind. And secondly, what Jesus is also saying is, here, saying is that there's one here that's even greater than David, that the one who is here is the Lord of the Sabbath himself. And so the principle is that if God allowed David to do it, how much more could the son of David, the Messiah himself, be allowed to do it? But to understand how important the story is and why the Pharisees were so offended by this, we have to take a moment and look at the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the fourth and the longest of the Ten Commandments. And the Sabbath goes from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And during that 24-hour period of time, you're not allowed to do any work. And so what you have to do is before sundown Friday, you have to make all your preparations for the next day. You gotta have all your food set aside. You gotta pay... Sydney's power bill, amen. You gotta, you know, you gotta clean the toilet, you gotta freshen your refrigerator, you gotta get all that done because you can't do anything during those 24 hours. You're not allowed to travel what's called a Sabbath day's journey from your house, which is three quarters of a mile. That's why, you ever wonder why there's so many Hasidic Jews in Williamsburg? I wonder that, maybe you don't wonder that. I mean, if you ever wonder that, the reason why is because they all have to live within three quarters of a mile of their synagogue. It's called a Sabbath day's journey. And so they have to be able to just walk to their synagogue on a, on a, during the Sabbath. So that's why they, they cluster in certain areas because they all have to live within three-quarter miles of their, of their synagogue if they want to observe the Sabbath. But you were not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath, and breaking the Sabbath was a capital offense. It was punishable by death. So this was not a small deal. And for the Pharisees, the Sabbath had become a matter of identity and national pride and a deep expression of their faith. This and circumcision were the two specific things that marked off the Jewish people from all the other nations of the earth. So this wasn't just an issue of of Old Testament interpretation. It was also an attack on their very identity and sense of self. Can we understand that? But what Jesus wants these Pharisees to see is that they had lost the forest for the trees. They had missed the whole spirit of the law. That in their desire to obey the Sabbath, which was actually an honorable desire, they had ended up surrounding it with an endless list of, an endless list of obligations to where the Sabbath had become this terrible, nightmarish burden. This thing that was intended to be a gift, where God is... This thing where God wants to bless us and he wants to give us a day off in Jesus' name, amen? I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It was like, uh, praise the God of Israel who invented the weekend, amen? (laughs) God invented the weekend. And then during the labor movement in the early 20th century, they expanded it to two days. Can we give the labor movement a round of applause? So I was like, but where did that idea come from that you have a day off? It's actually the Sabbath. God gave us a day off. William Barclay writing about this, listen to what he writes, it's a little bit of a long quote, but listen to what he writes about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was hedged around with literally thousands of petty rules and regulations. All work was forbidden. Work had been classified under 39 different heads and four of those heads were reaping, winnowing, threshing, and preparing a meal. By their action, the disciples had technically broken all these four rules and were to be classified as lawbreakers. It seems fantastic to us, but to Jewish rabbis, it was a matter of deadly sin and of life and death. The point of the Sabbath was not to bind us by a thousand little regulations like Gulliver and Gulliver's Travels. It was actually to do the opposite. It was to give human beings a day of rest, free from work and worry. And I want to tell you something. I think it's actually good even for Christians to practice the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath, not only do you take a physical day off, but you also take a mental day off, amen? You know, I've been thinking about this lately because I never stop thinking. Can I get an amen on that? Like, I never stop thinking. (laughs) That's what my mom always said about me. Always thinking, Mike. I never stop thinking. And when you pastor a church, you never stop thinking, amen? I'm just constantly thinking about different things. How are we gonna pay that bill? Why is that person mad at me? You know, it's all these these different things that end Part of what you feel when you come to church is you step into an environment where there's one area of your life where you don't have to be, you don't have to worry about anything. Well, Pastor Mike's gonna take care of it. And that's part of the honor of my life is to shepherd a community and, and to bear the responsibility of a church, but I never stop thinking about it. 
And recently, I was coming back from Rhode Island. I drove to Rhode Island to pick up that pipe and drape and those little kid walls in the back. And I was driving back from Rhode Island. I hadn't had a day off in two weeks. And my mind was like maxed out. And I'm like, I have to turn my brain off. Amen? And I just put on some like EDM music. <laughs> I got a Dunkin' Donuts coffee and I was on Highway 95. I'm like, for the next four hours, I'm not thinking about a thing. If our church crash and burns, it crash and burns, you know? I have got to turn my brain off. I do that when I go snowboarding. My temptation is to like listen to my political podcast and read the news and the Holy Spirit's like, Mike, stop, you're snowboarding, man, amen? Like you're in the mountains of Vermont. The whole point of doing this is not to think about those things. But that's what we're to do on the Sabbath is take a physical break and take a mental break. And we're to turn our brains off for 24 hours. And really what we're to do on the Sabbath is what Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. The whole point of the Sabbath is to show us that the crazy thing that happens when you take 24 hours off, you know what ends up happening? Actually, the universe keeps spinning, amen? Like the whole world doesn't fall apart because I'm not constantly thinking about it or stressing out about it. And that's the point of it is to show us, you know what, God is in control, you're not in control, you can relax, and everything is still gonna be okay if you're not perpetually anxious and worried and stressed about it. That's the point of the Sabbath. But the Pharisees had taken this beautiful gift from God and they had turned it into a terrible burden. And so what Jesus is seeking to do is Jesus is seeking to challenge them in that and bring them back to the original purpose of the law. And what's, fa- what's interesting too is when I taught through this uh, several years ago, I actually taught something that I don't agree with anymore and pastors never admit that, amen? <laughs> when I taught through this passage about three or four years ago, I taught that Jesus broke the Sabbath. And I was like, breaking the law. You know, Jesus broke the Sabbath. And it's like, no, I actually don't, I don't think Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. I think I was wrong four years ago. I think actually what Jesus is doing is he's showing the proper purpose of the Sabbath. But even if Jesus had wanted to break the Sabbath and if Jesus had wanted to allow his disciples to break the Sabbath, he could because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't Lord over Jesus. He's the Lord over the Sabbath because he was the creator of the Sabbath. Jesus is the king of the universe. That's the heater warming up in the background. He's like, who's banging the pipes? That's the heat. There's no authority higher than Jesus. So Jesus can do whatever he wants to with the Sabbath. And if Jesus had wanted to break the Sabbath or allow his disciples to break the Sabbath, he can allow them to do it because he's the Lord over the Sabbath. But there's five things I want us to see in this passage. Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus values people above religion. Jesus replaces religion with himself. Jesus is the bread of the presence. And Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And let's take a few minutes and unpack each of these. So the first one is Jesus is the Sabbath. Amen? Look at the quote by Tim Keller on your note sheet there. This is such a great quote. You quote people when you can't say it better than they could say it. And I can't say this better than Tim Keller. He says, the word Sabbath means a deep rest a deep peace, it's a near synonym for shalom, a state of wholeness and flourishing in every dimension of life. When Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus means that he is the Sabbath. He's the source of the deep rest we need. He's come to completely change the way we rest. The one day a week rest we take is just a taste of the deep divine rest we need and Jesus is its source. So God gives us a Sabbath as a day of rest where we take both the physical and mental time off and remember that he's in control. But here's what I want you to hear. It's that there's an even deeper rest that the Sabbath was pointing to. A rest that all the vacations and all the days off and all the working from home and all the pajama, and all the pajama Fridays can't solve, amen? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that where you, know, you take a week off for vacation and then you need another week, you need another week off to recover from your vacation? Or you think, man, if I could just, you know, skip church and sleep in all Sunday in my flannel pants, I would, I would be all the rest I need. And yet there's still a sense of, there's like a rest that you can't find. That there's this deeper rest that we need from all of our efforts to make ourselves right with God, from all of our striving, from all of our attempts to find fulfillment in this world. There's a deep rest, a rest for our souls that we can only find in Jesus. You can't find it in the Bahamas, amen? 
can't find it. You definitely can't find it in Orlando. Amen? It's like you... There's a rest for our souls. Listen to this, church. There's a rest for our souls that can only be found in Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Where do we find soul rest? There's only one place we can find rest for our souls, and it's in Jesus. And Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, even coming into the Sunday, I was thinking, every Sunday I try to like, all right, what's the word of the Lord for that Sunday? What does the Holy Spirit want to do on this particular Sunday? And the word I felt from the Lord is like, my, my people need to be refreshed. They just need refreshing. This world is so hard, this world is so draining, this world is so grinding, the news is so bad, that when we come into the house of God, the goal of the house of God is that you come into this church and that you are so spiritually refreshed, amen? That we find rest and restoration for our souls. On the cross, Jesus says, it is finished, Jesus did it all, the work is done, and so we can now rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Sabbath. Look at this quote by Tim Keller. It's another long, beautiful one. Look at what he says here. There's a work underneath our work that we really need to rest from. It's the work of self-justification. On the cross, Jesus is saying of the work underneath your work, the thing that truly makes you weary, this need to prove yourself because who you are and what you do are never good enough, that it's finished. He's lived the life you should have lived. He has died the death you should have died. If you rely on Jesus, his finished work, you know that God is satisfied with you. You can be satisfied with life. If you don't have the deep rest of the soul resting in what Jesus did on the cross, you will never truly rest. Secondly, Jesus values people above religion. What Jesus shows from the story of David is that human need always trumps religious obligations. Religion isn't more important than people. The whole point of the Bible, the whole point of the temple, the whole point of the priesthood and the law and the sacrifices was to help people. It's like church. The whole point of church is to help people, amen? I remember when I was going to Bible college, there was a little saying they used to say, church we love is the people we can't stand, <laughs> which is kind of a hard saying. I know I shouldn't have probably shared that, but like, but the whole point of it is people. Like the whole reason why we do this is so that people can be refreshed, so that people can encounter Jesus. But when religion and religious observance becomes more important than people, then we've gotten it all wrong. When it becomes religion for religion's sake, then we've lost the plot. And that's what Jesus is trying to show the Pharisees here. In their desire to honor and obey the law, they had missed the spirit and the intent of the law. Jesus wasn't breaking the Sabbath. He was helping them to see the true heart of the Sabbath. Thirdly, and this is one of my favorite points, Jesus replaces religion with himself. Again, I love what Tim Keller writes. Look at this quote on your note sheet. It's the last one by Tim Keller. Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins, and the religious leaders called that blasphemy. But Jesus goes on to make a claim so outrageous that the leaders have no word for it. Jesus declares not that he's come to reform religion, but that he's here to end religion and replace it with himself. There's a really important idea that I want you guys to grasp. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in the church, God replaces the law with Jesus. The law was just a temporary guardian until Jesus came. So as Christians, what's our guide? What's our pattern of life? What's the governing principle of how we are to live and behave? Jesus. How amazing is that? So you think of the Old Testament let me grab my Bible. I'm going to show you the, the... So you can do all of this or you can have Jesus. Amen? <laughs> all of the Old Testament was replaced with Jesus. Jesus is our Torah. The law has been replaced with a person, Jesus. 
And so how do we obey God? How do we be the people God wants us to be? How do we have a relationship with God? We now have a relationship with God through Jesus. The law was describing a person and the perfect embodiment of the law was Jesus. And so when we walk with Jesus, when we act like Jesus, when we draw near to Jesus, we actually perfectly fulfill the Old Testament law. Paul called this the law of Christ. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 through 21, to the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews, to those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law, to those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those under the law. Jesus is our Torah, Jesus is our high priest, Jesus is our temple, Jesus is our final sacrifice, Everything has been replaced with Jesus. Jesus is the end of religion. And we're right with God, we receive forgiveness and eternal life, and we have a relationship with our creator through being in a personal relationship with Jesus. Isn't that so beautiful? Isn't that amazing? That everything that God requires of us just comes from knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, walking with Jesus. And Jesus is my absolute best friend. I adore Jesus, I love him. And we find our identity now not in circumcision or Sabbath, or Sabbath observance or the temple or the keeping of the law or nationalism or religion, but we find our identity in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our identity. He's the one who defines us and gives us meaning. Fourthly, Jesus is the bread of the presence. And I found this so fascinating and I had actually never read about this before. So I kind of went down like a Bible nerd trail this week, amen? And I just want to take a minute and just kind of unpack this, is that everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything was a type and a foreshadowing of Christ, even in the tabernacle. And if you ever want to go, if you ever want to do a really amazing study, study the tabernacle, and every different part of the tabernacle actually is a picture of Jesus Christ. And when you went into the tabernacle, there was this table in the holy place that was made of acacia wood and covered in gold. And on every Sabbath, the priest would go in and on this table, they would, pla they would place 12 loaves of, of bread made from fine flour and two stacks. And then the next Sabbath, they would take the older bread out, they would eat it and they would put new bread in. And this bread was called the bread of the presence or the literal Hebrew is the bread of the face. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for presence is face. And What's interesting about this bread is that this bread, it wasn't for Yahweh. You see, the pagan gods, you actually fed the pagan gods. In the ancient world, you would go and you would offer food and you would actually feed that pagan god. You know, I've shared this story before. Is one time I was in Bali about 13, 14 years ago, and I was staying in Kuda, which is um, like this little surf village, and I got up really early one morning, and I went to the Starbucks, and in front of the Starbucks was a little plate of food. And Bali is like a very polytheistic society. And what that, what that plate of food was, it was the food, I guess, for the god of Starbucks. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but it was literally like a plate with like rice on it and mango and a cigarette and some other things. And you would go in front of all these stores and there was a plate of food. And that food was literally to feed whatever the particular god of that business was. And that's how paganism works. But we don't feed Yahweh. Yahweh actually feeds us. Yahweh is the sustainer of us. So this bread that was in the holiest of holies, it wasn't to feed Yahweh. The bread in the holiest of holies was to feed us. And what this bread represented was Jesus. Yes, we have a physical hunger, but we also have a much deeper spiritual hunger. And I think actually that's what Asbury was tapping into, the Asbury revival. And I think part of the reason why it went so viral and it, it had positive reviews in the New York Times and the Washington Post and Fox News and CNN and why it got so much coverage is I think there is such a deep spiritual hunger in our culture today. I saw a photo the other day of Madonna of all people and she had a hat on and her hat said spiritually hungry. There is so much spiritual hunger in our culture. And the only one who can truly satisfy the spiritual hunger is Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me 
shall never thirst. There's a bread in God's presence. There's food in God's presence. There's a spiritual food in the presence of God that feeds and satisfies the deepest cravings of the human heart. And that bread is Jesus. He is the bread of the presence. And the last point is Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, God instituted the Sabbath to give us a day of rest, and it's grounded in the fact that God created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh. And so since God instituted the Sabbath, then he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And so when Jesus says that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, what is Jesus saying? He's making a radical, shocking claim. He is saying, I'm God. I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the God who made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. It's me. Jesus is making the shocking claim that the God of Genesis has become a human being in the person of Jesus. That's the radical truth of the gospel of Mark, and that's the radical claim at the heart of Christianity. And I want you to look at this quote. It's on your note sheet there. It's by N.T. Wright. I want to close with this. How can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that fire has become flesh, that life itself became life and walked in our midst? Christianity either means that or it means nothing. It's either the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality of the world or it's a sham, a nonsense, a bit of deceitful play acting. Most of us, unable to cope with saying either of those things, condemn ourselves to live in the shallow world in between. The radical idea at the heart of Christianity is that the creator of the universe became a human being in the person of Jesus. Jesus is a Sabbath. Jesus values people above religion. Jesus replaces religion with himself. Jesus is the bread of the presence, and Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen, church? Let me pray. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, for everybody that's in this room today. And Jesus, you are so amazing. You are so incredible that the only one who can satisfy us, Lord, the only one who can meet our deepest need, God, the only one who can satisfy that that spiritual hunger and craving inside of us is you, Jesus. But you came into the world and you lived a sinless life and you died on the cross and you rose from that and you made yourself available so we can come into your house and we can feast upon you, Lord. I pray, first of all, Lord, if there's anybody in this room this morning that doesn't know you, that Jesus, in in these final moments together, that they would surrender their life to you today, Lord Jesus, that they would give their life to you, God. I pray for anybody in this room this morning, Lord, they feel dry, they feel weary, Lord Jesus. I ask that you would refresh them and you would fill them again with your Holy Spirit right now, God. I pray for anybody in this room this morning, Lord, that has, that's depressed or discouraged or stressed out or has suicidal thoughts, that Jesus, right now, you would touch and heal their minds, God. You would quiet the voice of the enemy. You would quiet all the negative thoughts, God, and you would flood their mind right now with supernatural peace, Lord Jesus. I pray for anybody in this room this morning that has a physical ailment or, or a sickness that they're wrestling with, Jesus, I ask that you would touch them and heal them. And I pray for all of us this morning, Lord, that you would refresh us, you would fill us overflowing with your Holy Spirit, and you would renew us this morning in this house. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We adore you, and we're so thankful for you. Help us find that rest that can only be found in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Everyone stand up. If you're here for the first time, what we're gonna do in these last moments is we're gonna sing two last worship songs. And what I encourage you to do in these final moments is is just to press into Jesus, do business with Jesus. If you wanna go over and take communion, you can take communion. If you wanna go over on the rugs and get on your knees, but let's come to Jesus this morning and wherever we need him, let's ask him to feed us and help us and minister to us. Let's worship Jesus in these final moments together.
was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The king of love had given up his life The darkest day in history They made for sinners For every curse His blood atoned One final breath And it was finished But not the end We could have known For the earth began to shake
Father, thank you for the example that is Jesus Christ. Thank you for every person here this morning, Lord. You've been clearly trying to communicate that, that every person here matters, Lord. Every single person in this room matters. And if you don't feel like you matter, that is a lie. It is a lie. You might not know Jesus. You might not know his character or his truth. But you matter. is the same God on the mountain and in the valley. So God, we ask you in the name of Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, strike down those fears in these people today, Lord. Strike them down. Perfect love drives out fear, and you may have never experienced love but God is love. And he loves everybody in this room. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and for being a good God. You are so faithful.
love you. Can we just say, Jesus, I love you? Just say it out loud. Just say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you, Jesus, for living a sinless life and dying on the cross and rising from the dead so we could be forgiven and healed and made whole. We thank you that we can find that rest for our souls that we can't find anywhere else in this world. We can find it in you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray you would heal every heart and every mind in this room. I pray that all depression and anxiousness and fear and worry and discouragement and stress and suicidal thoughts, that they would end in the name of Jesus. Fill us overflowing with your joy, God. Fill us overflowing with your power. Fill us overflowing with your Holy Spirit and fill us with your love, Lord Jesus. You are the King of Kings. You are reigning in glory. And in Jesus Christ, everything is going to be okay. We love you, Jesus. We've read the end of the story. You win. You win, Jesus. Come on, one more time. Let's just sing that part, last part of that song with you one last time. Come on, lift your hands. And as you sing, break off any discouragement. Break off anything this morning that's not of the Lord. Come on, sing it all off of you. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you. Come on, can we give Jesus Christ a round of applause in the church? Can we give the worship team a round of applause for doing such an excellent job? They get the MVP award for this Sunday, amen? So, all right, we'll come out to house church this Tuesday night. We'll see you for seek night in a week and a half. We love you. Have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for joining.